Welcome to the final episode of our read-along book club of Yoko Agawa's The Memory Police. Well, we've reached the end, and I'd have to say that none of my questions have really been answered here, with the exception of what kind of book this is. This is not a book of plot. I was making some, some wild guesses, at least noting some things that she was planting along the way. Events that you'd think would be detrimental to certain characters in the story or, or have pivotal consequences, one might say, but nothing really came of that, right? We, we do know that she has lost the old man, uh, the biggest thing in her life, the biggest person in her life, uh, somebody who has cared for her greatly since the loss of her parents, and even his death remains a mystery. They have some ideas, but they don't quite know exactly what happened. But before I begin, let me know what you're thinking. How were you feeling when you reached the end of the novel? Was it um, what you had expected? Or was it just a complete disappointment or maybe a pleasant surprise? I'd have to say overall, I really enjoyed this novel. Um, it, it got me thinking about things. And I was saying on the Discord, oh yeah, if you're not on the Discord, totally get on the Discord. Uh, Lee and I were talking about it and he, he said, I have to stay away. I have to think a little bit about it. And I, I agree with that. I, I don't know what it's about either. I thought I knew what it was going to be about, about the power of memory. And maybe it still is part of that. And to make sure we... Don't forget the things, right? Don't let the past go because there's importance in the past. However, getting to the end of the section, it didn't really solidify that fact. It didn't cement it in my mind that that is the answer to what this book is about. But that is a great thing. That is a great thing about fiction. Um, you don't want all the answers. At least I don't. Maybe you out there do. And it kind of frustrates me when I hear people uh, doing commentary about books or movies when they're, they're asking the wrong questions, like Cormac McCarthy's The Road. For instance, when people always want to know, why did the world end? What was the event? It's like, that's not what the book's about. And so this book is obviously also not about what the memory police are, who they are, what they're doing, what is the fate of the world outside of this, this sleepy little island in the East. I will quit rambling because there's a lot to talk about here. Let us begin with chapter 25. At around 7.30 that evening, a call came from the hospital saying that the old man had collapsed in front of the butcher shop. And she ended up running all the way to the hospital. And the old man was not in a bed, but rather had been laid out on a plain metal table with wheels that resembled a kitchen cart. By the time they arrived on the scene, his heart had already stopped and they discovered an intracranial hemorrhage. But it is also possible that he had a heart attack and hit his head as he fell. So again, we're not quite sure. But that doesn't matter, right? It's not about the answers. And part of me loves that because we want to know how the old man died. I think we're just always trying to have these answers in our head as human beings, right? We want the answer. We want to solve the riddle. She does not give it to us. She gives us possibilities, but not the definitive answer, which to me feels like the overall message of this entire book because we were not given all the answers. But this is the key line right here. The first thing I saw were the old man's hands folded on his chest. Hands that would never make anything again. I remembered how much trouble he'd had skewering the pickle or feeling the objects inside the statues. And the old man's shopping basket had been left next to the cart. Carrot greens and a package wrapped in butcher's paper peeking out from the top. So, obviously, the key uh, line in that is his hands never make anything again. But um, she's just thinking about all of the great things he's done for her. But we go into more detail a little bit later on about how important this man was to her. The funeral was modest. Those in attendance included a few distant relatives, the grandson of a cousin, a niece, and her husband, some old friends from work, and a few neighbors. And here she is recounting the death of her mother and father. Their deaths grew distant with the years, leaving behind the most precious memories I associated with them. And that's generally what happens. When we lose somebody, uh, hopefully anyway, we think of all the great things they did for us in our lives, throughout our lives. And considering this is the very final thing, the, the biggest loss anyway, well, <laughs> I guess that's debatable. But the biggest loss to her in this moment is the loss of this old man, who was a very grandfatherly figure. He helped her uh, get R in the basement. He helped just comfort her, right? And she repaid him back the best she could when she could. In fact, allowing him to live with her in her house. But this time I had the impression that something was different. In addition to the sadness, I was overcome by a mysterious and menacing anxiety, as though the old man's death had suddenly transformed the very ground under my feet into a soft, unreliable mass. I'd been left alone, with no one to comfort me, no one to reach out and take my hand, no one to share the terrible void in my heart. This really makes me think that, because we know she disappears at the end, right? She completely disappears. 
even though she has R, he doesn't seem to fill that void, right? To quote unquote, uh, ter the terrible void in her heart. And maybe that's part of the message of the book too, is that, um, you know, once we have nobody at all, we just kind of fade away. I'm not quite sure. I'm kind of just thinking out loud as I'm reading this over again. And in order to boost my courage, I threw myself into the activities of daily life, which is a very common occurrence. When we've lost somebody or have had a very traumatic event, we try to do absolutely anything to take our mind off it. Yet when I crawled in bed at night, what came was not sleep, but deep exhaustion and anxiety. I would go to the desk and take out my manuscript. I could think of no other way to pass the night. So she's returning to her writing yet again. And from time to time, for just a moment, one of the objects would show me something more, a slight curve in the shape or depth of color that would catch my eye, and I would startle, wondering whether this could be the revelation that R was hoping for. So this is a little spark of hope for us, but alas, we know that um, it does not save her. And one night I made an effort to write some words on the manuscript paper. I wanted to leave a record of what I saw in that dimly illuminated void of my memories. So a record, right? I think that's the great thing about uh, creating anything, right? If it's a book, music, uh, a film, any, any kind of creative thing, because it's going to outlive you, right? And it's kind of cool to think about uh, people discovering that long after you've gone and, and, and maybe uh, trying to hypothesize about what kind of person you were. Nor did I have the confidence in the things I wrote, and yet my fingers were moving, however slowly. I soaked my feet in water. It had taken me an entire night to write that one line. So she's actually progressing. It's very, very difficult for her, but it's really cool to see that even though novels have disappeared, she is still able to start to create these things. It's just scribbling, I told him. Not something you need to read. Don't be silly, he said at last, placing the page carefully on his desk. It's extraordinary progress. This is the first thing you've written without tearing holes in the paper with your eraser. I don't know if you can call it progress. It's more like a whim. Tomorrow I may be unable to write anything. No, don't say that. These stories have begun to stir again. The meaning isn't important. What matters is the story hidden deep in the words. You're at the point now where you're trying to extract that story. Your soul is trying to bring back the things it lost in the disappearances. Not a speck of dust floated on the water. I looked out on the grassy meadow. When the wind blew, it made patterns in the grass. Patterns like those in cheese nibbled by mice. That's wonderful. You're doing fine. And R took each piece of paper and added it to the pile. The first disappearance since the death of the old man. And I really like the way Yoko Ogawa handled this. She didn't give it to us right away. She didn't tell us exactly what it was. She allowed us to experience this loss through the character's POV. And I pulled back the quilt and made a bizarre discovery. Something was st stuck fast to my hip. Had I come down with some sort of disease? Perhaps an enormous tumor had developed overnight. <laughs> her talking about her leg. First, I put my weight on my right leg and slowly sat up. But, but as I did, the thing fell with a heavy thud and I was thrown to the floor. The problem was the pants, which seemed to have two openings. Two openings for what? What could they be for? Uh, but the more I studied it, the more I realized that it had a shape that would exactly fit the other opening in my pants. So what's interesting about this part is that we have two legs. They're, they're more or less identical. Uh, she knows what her right leg is. However, uh, she has no idea what her left leg is, even though it looks exactly the same. And this is a, a cool way to further explain or further demonstrate uh, what a disappearance is because so far we've had things disappear that are more or less unique where it's a grouping of things that may or may not be different. However, uh, to think about um, us losing uh, one leg or disappearing one leg or having a leg disappear, I should say, while having the other, that's, that's quite interesting. The neighbors were gradually beginning to gather in the streets outside. They all seemed to be wondering how to deal with their own bodies. How can this be happening? A lot of unexpected things have disappeared, but never anything as shocking as this. And the cold makes another appearance, the snow in fact, with the cold creeping up from the snow, bring feeling back to it. I wonder, I said, screwing up the courage to ask the question that had been on my mind for some time. How can we get rid of them? <laughs> so at this point, I, I was wondering if there was gonna be a, just a, a bloody massacre of, of left legs. Uh, people just bringing the saws out, cutting them off, maybe people dying in the streets. Maybe that's my, my bleak taste, my, my bleak personality, and maybe how I would write it. I don't know, but that's not where we go. At the moment, we saw three members of the memory police come toward us from the other end of the street. What would they do if they found us here, still in possession of our legs? I'm laughing because when I was reading this, this definitely made me laugh. It's kind of absurd 
but it's kind of, it's very sad. If the memory police didn't know how to get rid of their legs, they could hardly blame us for having ours. But they were walking with their usual even gait, perfectly in balance, as though the disappearance had caused them no difficulty. Which means, I don't get it, right? <laughs> I don't get what the memory police are. They clearly exist outside of this phenomenon that's happening, this disappearances. But why? They seem to be regular people. We don't ever get uh, another look at the headquarters. We only visit there once. We, we don't get any glimpses of, of an ex-memory police person or, or something to uh, just give us any more information, any more breadcrumbs to uh, what they are, what they represent. Uh, I'm not sure I feel about it. I, I love mystery. It didn't really bother me that we didn't understand that fact, but here she is planting things in our head that never get answered, but somehow I'm just okay with that. Uh, maybe they'll just fall off by themselves like leaves from a tree. But as he approached, I realized that his back leg had disappeared. This is poor Don. So Don the dog. Um, I had a question earlier on if uh, dogs experience these, dis these disappearances when um, the old man was playing the music box and he was kind of reacting strangely. Now we know. Now we know. That night in bed, R massaged my disappeared leg. He worked at it for a long time as though he thought his efforts might bring it back. Look, he said. Here you have five toenails lined up as neat as you please, smooth and translucent like the skin of a fruit. And there's the heel and the ankle, all the same as your right leg. And the lovely curve of your knee fits perfectly in the palm of my hand. You can feel the intricate bone structure. Your thigh is amazingly white and your calf is soft and warm. I can feel every part of your leg, each scratch and bruise and bump. How can you say all that has disappeared? But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I'm happy you're here. I told him, happy to know you'll go on looking after my leg even though it's gone. <laughs> Sorry. It's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. The other legs on the island must feel sad and abandoned. Maybe because we haven't been able to dispose of the thing that's disappeared and have to keep carrying it around with us. Though I'm already getting used to that, thanks to you. So I forgot to mention that. We do know that ceremoniously um, all these people burn things or toss them in the river or you know destroy them in some way, but they're not doing that with their legs. So is she subverting my expectations again? Uh, instead of turning this town into a uh, population of people, legless people who are bleeding to death? <laughs> I don't know. But this time there's nothing to be done. We can't burn them or crush them or throw them out in the sea. We just try to avoid them as much as possible. But I'm sure that will pass soon enough. I don't know how, but sooner or later everything will fall back into place. Fall back into place? What do you mean? Eventually, the whole left by our legs will find a place in our hearts and minds that fits it perfectly a place to fall into. But on my left leg, there was only a slight pressure, like the weight of a bit of modeling clay. Modeling clay, right? Because her mother made sculptures. I like that. Chapter 26. Gradually, we became accustomed to living without our legs. Even Don began running around again at full speed. The number of people who were taken away by the memory police suddenly increased. But now they found it impossible to imitate our new sense of balance, which makes sense. Uh, you know, Pretending you don't know what a bird is or a book is or a novel or anything like that. It, it might be difficult to um, to read that. But but to fake a limp, to fake the lack of knowledge um, that you have a left leg, that would be a tricky act indeed. This crackdown and the loss of the old man meant that our communication with R's wife had now been suspended for some time. But they decided upon a code. We decided that we would let the phone ring three times at a predetermined hour before hanging up. The signal that R was healthy and doing well. Three rings from the other end meant the message had been received and understood. But in order to set up the system, I needed to go back to the elementary school for the first time in a long while. When I did, I discovered that the meteorological box was no longer mounted on its post. I found it in pieces on the ground, perhaps destroyed in the earthquake or crushed under the weight of the snow. So all communication has been completely cut off. I continued with the task of writing strings of words that made almost no sense. I'd gotten to the point where the shapes of certain words seemed to be returning. I could vaguely recall the fingers of the typist locked away in the clock tower. Now we're starting to bring these things together. When I took Don out for a walk, I stopped at the ruins of the library to sit and gaze out at the sea. The rumor had continued to spread that they were planning to build a headquarters for the memory police on the site. But the piles of burned bricks had not been removed, and there was no sign that the construction would be starting anytime soon. Do you remember how the old man looked sitting right here? I asked Don. I never imagined it would be the last time I'd see him. Now when the waves were high, they hid the last bit of the boat still visible, and it seemed clear that it would soon vanish entirely beneath the surface. My heart ached when I thought about that day. Would I remember how we had eaten the cake in the wheelhouse, or made our plans to build the hidden room, 
or stood on deck, leaning against the rail, watching the sunset. It was more than my empty heart could stand. So she's breaking, and um, it is going to be a fitting end, definitely. By the time their right arms disappeared, people were less troubled than they had been with the disappearance of the right legs. Interesting. I would think that would be more unsettling, but um, what do I know? I've never had a leg disappear. The disappearances of body parts were worse, in fact, easier and more peaceful than earlier ones, as no one had to gather in the square to burn the objects or send them floating down the river. Okay, that makes sense, I guess. I was no longer able to carry a tray of food and climb down the ladder to the hidden room. The time will come when I won't be able to get in and out of this room, I told him. Don't be silly. I'll just pick you up and carry you, like a princess. Oh, R. So romantic. That would be wonderful, I said. But how can you hold something that has disappeared? Indeed, how can you? Well, he remembers, so that's how. Come on, you should know this. I can hold you. I can touch any part of you I want. You can touch me. But what does it mean if I don't feel anything? Oh, she's dropping some uh, thoughtful bombs on us right there. What does it mean? Um, clearly, it means something to the other person. But as a whole, what does it mean if, if one person cannot feel the touch of another? They're all illusions. My legs and arm and all the rest of things lined up on the shelves. So now she is definitely um, objectifying her, her body parts in such a way of uh, to compare them to the other things that have disappeared. My body will go on disappearing bit by bit, I said, shifting my gaze from my toes to my knees, from my hips to my chest. No, you mustn't say that. But I won't let you go, and I don't want to go. I want to stay with you, but that won't be possible. You just have to stay here. You'll be safe here, where all the lost memories are preserved, hidden along with the emerald and the perfume, the photographs and the calendars. Me? Here? Why not? He said. Because it's impossible. I said, shaking my head in confusion at this unexpected idea. My arm slipped from the bed and struck his knee. But it isn't. We're protected here. You, me, all the things that were hidden in the sculptures. Even the memory police haven't been able to find us. But I know the end is coming. And I'm frightened. Not because I'll disappear and cease to exist, but because I'll have to leave you. The thought terrifies me. You mustn't be afraid, he said, laying me down on the bed. I'll keep you safe here in my secret room. And that makes you wonder, when you're dying, right? You're always thinking that uh, it's the fear of death, right? But here she is saying it's not the fear of not existing, it's the fear of leaving this person or the things she loves behind. I guess I'll never know the answer to that until I am on my deathbed. Which brings us to 27. Sometimes it strikes me as strange that I don't hate him more. I should curse him and beat at him, find any way I can do to harm him, though I know it do no good. After all, he deceived me, stole my voice, and shut me up in this place. We're back in the book, everybody. We're back in the book. When I see his fingers working just for my benefit, I can't help feeling a kind of gratitude. Perhaps these feelings are proof that I'm becoming more and more attached to this room. I find, too, that my eyesight has recently started to fail. So now we're starting to see even clearer connections to the hidden room, to the story in the book. One day, something unusual happened, not long after he had gone down to teach a class of beginners. I heard the sound of footsteps coming up the stairs. I wonder who this could be. Do they intend to come all the way up here? From the sound of the footsteps, I was sure not only that the person approaching was a woman, but that she was very young. The tapping on the wooden stairs, like the pecking of a bird's beak, suggested that she was wearing high heels. Hurry now. If you aren't quick, she'll go away. But something held her back. She jiggled the lock and turned the handle, and then, with a sigh, she moved away from the door. That night, he appeared bringing with him more strange articles of clothing. The fabrics were more ordinary than usual. There were no decorations of any kind, and the stitching was crude. Did someone knock at the door? He asked. I gave a slight nod. Then why didn't you ask for help? He added as he began gathering up the clothes I had dropped. Indeed, why didn't she ask for help? Why didn't you run away? She could have helped you get out of here, and you would have been free by now. No answer, of course, because she can't speak. She's a new student at the beginner level he said. She came to me out of the blue today and asked about the top of the tower. She said that when she was a child, she used to be friendly with the old man who tended the clock and she wanted to climb up here again for old time's sake. So even more connection to the old man and the story we're reading. I knew that you were no longer capable of going back into the world. You've already been absorbed into this room. Did she call out from the other side of the door? I would have liked to have had you hear her voice. It's quite charming. Ooh, that is uh, salt in the wound. Not beautiful in any classical sense, more unusual and impressive. Like nothing I've ever heard. Deep resonance in the nasal cavity combined with moisture. 
from the tongue and a wavering tremolo on the lips, sweet enough to melt the eardrums. This guy turned out to be an evil dude. What do you plan to do with her? And why are you telling me all this? She needs a great deal more practice with her typing. She needs to develop speed and accuracy so I can capture her voice until it's completely absorbed and the keys no longer move. So now we know that that's his master plan. He's just uh, capturing these girls and stealing voices, apparently. Why? We don't quite know. Uh, we do know that um, our protagonist, our, our narrator, is writing this story, and, and she's clearly being inspired by what's happening to her, her in her own world. And after that, his visits became much less frequent, and I spent long periods of time alone. When he had cared for me, my body had retained a plump freshness, a certain grace, but now it was a lump of clay. Mm -hmm, indeed. Were those really my hands, my feet, my breasts? Even I wasn't certain. If he wouldn't touch me, they would never come back to life. So she's really hammering on us now. She's making it obvious. If, if we weren't certain yet what the point of this, uh, this story when the story was and how it connected to our narrator's real life, she's giving it to us right now. One night I filled the sink with water to soak my legs in order to be sure they still existed. See? But I felt nothing. My very existence was quickly being sucked away to some remote and inaccessible place. How long has it been now since he visited me? She's listening in bed, waiting to hear his footsteps climbing the stairs. The slightest creak gives me a start. He's coming. But I'm always disappointed, deceived by the moaning of the wind or mice scuttling across the floor. I heard the sound of footsteps. He's coming. And behind him, someone else. Someone wearing high heels. The two sets of footsteps overlap with each other blend together as they approach the door. She must be carrying a typewriter, one with keys that no longer move. I am absorbed silently into the room, leaving no trace. Perhaps I'll find my voice again, lost so long ago. The footsteps stop. He turns the key. The final moment has arrived. So she disappears before our narrator disappears, which makes sense because she's writing the story. And uh, it, it seems like our narrator is writing this to just cope with the inevitable. She's completing her story, uh, before it's done, clearly. But there's a little bit of a cliffhanger there, right? She knows the final moment has come. What is it? I think we know what it is, so she didn't need to explain it. Which brings us to chapter 28. I put down my pencil and rested my head on the desk, utterly exhausted. I had no real confidence that this was the story R wanted, but at least I had reached the end of the chain of words. I had completed the one thing I would be able to leave him. So again, a legacy, something we leave behind after we disappear. R alone was determined to find every possible means to keep me here. And though I knew all his efforts were useless, I did little to dissuade him. I know how hard you have to work, he said, but I can't tell you how happy I am to be holding this manuscript. He gathered up the pages, running his hands over the stack. But it doesn't seem to be enough to stop my soul from winding down. I wonder whether the story will remain after I disappear. Of course it will. Each word you wrote will continue to exist as a memory here in my heart, which will not disappear. You can be sure of that. And that makes me wonder, is she trying to tell us too that the, th the things we leave behind aren't necessarily for our own ego, right? To be remembered, but it's for the people that we leave behind. Allow them to have a, a, a part of ourselves, you know, in the physical, essentially. They'll always have the memories, but her giving R this manuscript is, is something that he can physically hold on to. When our left legs first disappeared, we were thrown off balance and didn't know how to manage. But once our entire bodies were gone, no one seemed particularly upset. Don was no longer able to jump at the tree branches to knock down the snow, but he found new ways to amuse himself with nothing but the front, left leg, jaw, ears, and tail that remained to him. Oh, poor Don, man. I, I, this is why I love dogs. They, they will always um, find the best in any situation. No one had ever come to repair the cracks in the streets that had been left by the earthquake, and the restaurants, movie theaters, and parks in town were deserted. There was no sign whatsoever that the snow would disappear. It occurred to me suddenly that it was fortunate that the old man had died before the disappearances of the body had begun. That meant that I could still recall the feeling of his dear hand on mine. So that's interesting. So she can't feel anything because her body's disappeared, but she has the memory of what that feeling is. I feel like this whole story is a puzzle within a puzzle within a puzzle. And I like the mention that, that there was no sign that the snow would ever disappear. You know, I guess you could equate the end of our lives to winter, right? The, the, the cold, the dead season. And once the calendars disappeared, that was it. Winter never left. So uh, maybe she was planting in our heads way back when that uh, the entire town was doomed. All of the characters in it, especially, especially our narrator. The days flowed by monotonously and uneventfully. But no matter how tightly we held each other on the bed, 
We could not escape the fact that the distance between us continued to grow. The hand that had written the story, my eyes overflowing with tears, the cheeks that had received them, they all disappeared in their turn. And in the end, all that was left was a voice. I love that. In that sense, the complete disappearance of my body was actually a form of liberation. It's peaceful with just a voice, I said. With just a voice, I think I'll be able to accept my final moment calmly and quietly without suffering or sadness. You'll finally be able to leave here, I told him. You'll be free to return to the outside world. The memory police have given up their hunt. Even when I'm gone, you must take care of this room. I hope my memory will live on forever here through you. It was becoming more difficult to breathe. I looked around. My body was now included among the objects arranged on the floor. Do you really have to go? He asked, gathering to his chest the air he held in his hands. Goodbye. The last traces of my voice were frail and hoarse. Goodbye. For a very long time, he sat staring at the void in his palms. When at last he had convinced himself that there was nothing left, he let his arm drop wearily. Then he climbed the ladder, one rung at a time, lifted the trap door, and went out into the world. Sunlight came streaming in for one moment, but vanished again as the door creaked shut. The faint sound of the rug being rolled out on the floor came to me from above. Closed in the hidden room, I continued to disappear. That brings us to the end of The Memory Police. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed this book. Um, I don't think I got any answers, really, and I don't think this book was uh, written to give us answers, to be figured out. It really, to me, feels like it exists to remind us. Just as the narrator passed on her manuscript to R, Yoka Agawa has pass this this book to us to remind us don't forget the people that have uh, left us behind and also don't forget the people that we will inevitably leave behind ourselves thanks for hanging out with me and thanks for reading along with me as always i really enjoy uh, experiencing books like this and and allowing them to create conversations with all of you out there because they definitely stay with me longer when i read them this way as opposed to in isolation. And don't forget to uh, let me know your thoughts about this book in the comments below or the Discord if you're there. And keep an eye out for the next video where I am going to present all of the books that were submitted for our very next read-along because I don't intend to stop these things. I know they don't get a lot of views, but I thoroughly enjoy them. Selfishly, I make these videos. All right, thanks again, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.